Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our workshop. Uh, we are PeopleOps Guild. Uh, it's really a privilege to be able to speak at DEF CON and share with you what we're all passionate about. Oh, sorry, I'm short of breath. I was just running from bathroom. Anyways, um, I think uh, we will give you a little bit of introduction what this is about. But pretty much we're going to have two hours, which are going to be quite, uh, quite easy going. We thought of four different workstations that we will split into afterwards. But um, to begin with, we'll look into the topic we're actually covering here. And we assume all of you are interested in building the talent inside of your organization. Hey. You're either a DAO operator, an educator, a leader, or someone who's just really passionate about building talent in your org. So that instead of always looking for talent from outside, you can bring in some people who are maybe not as experienced at Web3 or not at the senior level, and you can build them uh, and help them uh, evolve inside of your org, becoming much stronger and happier and successful. And also like contributing to your uh, your project's uh, overall success. Yeah. So, <laughs> to begin with, Loi, do you want to yes. continue? Yeah, yeah. I'll give a little bit of like background context too about who we are. Um, so, I've been doing people operations in the crypto space for about four and a half years. Um, and I often felt like an island <laughs> in my project. There's like nobody else who is working on people issues. Um, and it can feel like, wow, these other people have a different mentality and I just wanted peers, right? So I found out that there were many other little islands in other crypto orgs. Turns out we're an archipelago of uh, people ops staff in, in various entities. Um, people with backgrounds in Aragon and Gitcoin and Giveth and people currently in Pocket and Giveth and um, Chainsafe currently in Gitcoin, in DXDAO, in MakerDAO, um, and many more. And so we try to bring together the wisdom of what's going on in the realm of like managing people in crypto, it's pretty different, right? Whether you're a DAO or you're a crypto company, even if you have like a company structure, still like half of your people are like crypto anarchists, right? So they don't really <laughs> align to traditional structures of management um, and what it takes to build a healthy team and maintain a healthy team is pretty different than in the trad world. So that's why we've all come together and we face our problems uh, as they arise. We find we're often facing some of the same problems at the same times. You know, last year we all went through swells in recruitment and trying to stay balanced and how do you do that ethically? We've also gone through a lot of themes of compensation um, as the bear market started to hit. How do we build, um, you know, ways of um, assessing compensation, assessing competency that is crypto native, um, but really helps us budget well. Um, so we've, we've faced many of these themes, many of these people problems that the space encounters. Um, and today, we want to talk about building the builders, biddling the biddlers. <laughs> um, and it's really timely, I think, because as we settle into a bear market, it's this natural time for professional development and growth within. You're not going to be hiring as many people from external to the crypto space. We can't just rely on, you know, yanking experts from Web2 anymore. Those people are expensive and out of touch sometimes. <laughs> and so there's this natural phase where in crunch mode, in bear market times, contributors who do stay, they have to step up to the plate to take on new responsibilities, new levels of professionalism and proficiency. And it's up to us um, as org leads, DAO operators, 
or even just contributors who care. It's up to us to, to help our organizations foster that environment of growth, right? Um, so that's why we're here today. Um, and as Linka said, we've got four different breakout stations that we'll go into um, at like 30 minutes after the hour. Um, and we'll get into the description of those in a little bit, but I want to take us through the life cycle of people operations. Do we have a clicker? I, I don't think we do. Is anyone here helping us with the slides? <laughs> okay, while we're waiting for technical things, I want to just hear a couple shout outs. Like, what's a big people problem that you notice happening in this space? Team health, you know, rage quits, it could be anything. Anybody? What kind of people problems are you seeing happen in teams? Anybody, yeah? Anybody has a people problem? <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, fiefdoms. Oh, fiefdoms. Yes. Yeah. Cool. So, power structures. Anyone else? Sometimes what people want to do doesn't align with the best interests of the DAO. Hmm. Good one. Anybody else? Sometimes people come for instant uh, for incentives, and when they dry out, they can go elsewhere, or they come for instant instant gain instead of mm -hmm. long term growth of the, the DAO. Heck yeah! Isn't that why we love bear market building? Thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I have my slides now, so <laughs> so I think we'll just move to that. Um, yeah. So I talked a little bit about. Um, what we do as the People Ops Guild, um, where we come from. Um, but yeah, we, we try to educate this space. We try to educate ourselves and just be a learning hub together. We're also available to anyone who needs some help. If you have a uh, like consult that you want to request, um, we're happy to share our resources. Um, there's a few different educational resources that we have put out, um, some like worksheets and um, an article, um, but we're also down to take people's questions and you can reach us um, by scanning QR code. There'll be also more opportunities for that QR code later too. Okay, so um, can, I'm going to stand up so I can see this. Hi. Okay, so um, this to me is the whole life cycle of people operations in the crypto space. A lot of people are like, what the heck is people ops? I don't know. Are you HR? That sounds stuffy. I hate HR. What is this? <laughs> um, but it's a little bit different in crypto orgs. Um, so kind of at the at the entry at the 12 o'clock we have like the hiring process we have like the discussion of compensation and benefits which often is left out in crypto jobs um we have onboarding processes can be kind of hard in DAOs. we have um role definition and work contracts work contracts can be super different in like non-legal entities or in very inventive legal entities um, then we have uh, you know the maintenance of culture once people are really in the org we got team building and and vibe maintenance um, we got IRL time with our teams these are all things that people operations do then we come to professional development opportunities for our contributors as they've already settled into their role and they need some time to grow. Um, how are they gonna know if they need to grow? Performance review. But it doesn't usually work in a typical managerial sense in all crypto orgs. So a lot of us have some form of decentralized peer review. Um, we also have conflict resolution as well as like one-on-one -on -one contributor support for hard times. These are things that People Operations provides. Um, and some orgs have a code of conduct too. And this is something that's tended by People Operations staff. So when we look at this whole life cycle, I see the main things for contributor development 
being um, obviously the professional development and the peer review. And sometimes, actually, a lot of the team building and team RL, IRL time, because you get a lot of educational opportunities in that time. We're all here learning at DevCon, right? We're growing so much just by being here. Um, and so education and professional development and peer review are the main things that we're gonna talk about today for contributor development. And now I wanna invite some of our guilds to speak about their experiences with that. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, I'm Lenka. Uh, I'm basically not officially a people ops person, so I always feel like a, like a black sheep in this group, but it's kind of fun because it's something I'm uh, passionate about. And I got uh, close to this topic uh, while I was uh, working on a project together with my teammates. We called it X-Ray and we were researching the centralized workforce. We were researching uh, the ways to best attract, onboard, and retain talent. And the team I'm at, uh, in our language, core unit, it's called SES, Sustainable Ecosystem Scaling, at MakerDAO. And uh, yeah, the personal story I wanna share here with you is actually my, uh, my time when I learned that the Maker Foundation, as you probably know, is closing down. And basically there's this completely new structure uh, where people should kind of like sell themselves as contributors to the DAO and be voted in. So it was like a really big change and transition, but we kind of knew this is coming because our organization has always committed to like progressive decentralization. And when the time came, um, I just want to share that uh, the good experience I had from my org because um, on one hand, if you are a bit more a uh, centralized organization, you actually do not want to uh, have, um, like, you don't want to mess with the process of DAO uh, contributor onboarding. So you actually do not want to influence or wait in when it comes to making this decision. But I was super fortunate that we were let some sort of a wiggle room where we could actually in a bit more peace and less stress, figure out whether we want to transition into DAO, how do we want to transition, and uh, basically uh, we were allowed that space without the foundation kind of like abusing its, it could abuse its power uh, because they, you know, they have a lot of influence. So basically um, I was in a situation where I had a bit more time uh, and space to be able to figure this out and get the support uh, from the foundation side, but not the support of helping me get there, but checking on me and uh, hearing my, uh, my plans and figuring out what other uh, work and uh, important things I'm managing, I'm leaving behind so that the transition is smooth. Uh, so I think that's a really good example to share with you. If you are in a situation where you have a, a bit more startup traditional organization and you're looking into how you want to decentralize. So I think that was a really nice approach to offer that safe space, but do not interfere with that. And yeah, the funny thing is that I used to do, uh, I was part of the Marcoms team and I used to do like events management and community building. And when I transitioned to the DAO, I just said, okay, I wanna try something new. And I kind of had to figure out a way to apply myself and I became a project lead. So completely different thing. You can have some experiences, but it's really nice this opportunity. So that's what I wanted to share with you, this short thing. Who do we have next? <laughs> what? So who wants to go next? This one, this one works. Um, so thanks you for sharing that, Lenka. I didn't prepare a share for you guys, but I just wanna tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. My name is Melanie. I am a contributor to DXDAO. I lead the contributor experience there. I, uh, I have a traditional background in HR. So pretty much my entire career, I've covered all things under the HR umbrella, like recruiting, compliance, performance management, all the way to talent management. Um, and coming into a DAO has been a completely different experience. 
but definitely learning these skills and like gaining that type of knowledge has given me the skill set to really help support my team, help to, uh, support my squad um, and my DAO. So today, I'm actually going to be at the peer review workstation, and we're going to be talking about um, building a culture of feedback, um, introducing some mechanisms that you guys can use within your DAO, um, and then applying them to certain cases. But that's a little bit about me and who I am, and yeah, thank you for joining. Awesome. Um, yeah, thank you all for being here. I'm Saf. I do people ops at Gitcoin. Um, Gitcoin's an example of an organization. I think we've like gone through all of the things that Loie mentioned earlier, where we've grown really quickly. We're up to like 45 um, full-time contributors in the past year. Um, and uh, yeah, like I, you know, being the peop uh, a people ops person, I have gone through sort of like many of the the different pieces of the um, the contributor life cycle. Um, yeah, like just doing a lot of hiring and uh, when we were still in bull times um, and then realizing that there's a lot of org debt that we've accumulated um, in the bull times that we now kind of have to, um, uh, yeah, like set up uh, structure and processes for. Um, so yeah, I've been involved with like compensation creation at Gitcoin um, and today I'm just, uh, I'm here with Anna and Melanie at the peer review station. Yeah, thank you. Hey guys, thanks for being here with us. I'm Anna. Um, I work at Chainsafe and I come from traditional Web 2 space and came into Web 3 two years ago with, you know, a, a bunch of tools from Web 2 can be implemented in Web 3 just with different, different outlooks and basically adjusting and making it work as well. So happy to be here and talk about that today. Um, I'll keep it brief and short. And uh, yeah, the the peer review <laughs> the peer review review station is super robust and it's going to be a great um, breakout group. So, um, Heather, I don't know if you want to say just a little bit about um, recruitment and what you guys will talk about there. Hi, um, my name is Heather, um, and I'll be filling in for Francis at the recruitment station station, and I currently work for Giveth. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, like, thanks all for showing up. I thought we would be speaking to a room of crickets, but it's really <laughs> awesome <laughs> that there's, like, so many people in here that are, like, really passionate about this, or at least interested, um, as we are. And um, a little bit about myself is I don't come from HR at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm actually trained as a uh, clinical I, oh, I also stutter, so if, if I stutter during our breakout session, that's just me. But I come from a clinical mental health um, counselor background. So I got my master's in that, and I worked in an, an adult psychiatric hospital, a locked unit for five years over in Denver. And um, it sounds like maybe it's not transferable, but I think in this like wild west of Web3, <laughs> There definitely is. I'm like, all right. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so I think through that experience, um, what taught me a lot about that is how important job satisfaction is to everyone. You know, if like you have purpose in life, if you have a job that you like, you're probably going to be happy overall. And I think it's really important that like we try and create like a curated workspace so like people show up excited for their jobs that they're having fun with their teams that they're laughing and if like you have that like good vibe going on in your team chances are you're going to be more productive you're going to have more retention and like people are going to be proud to like work for your org so um and i think the very part of that starts at the re recruitment process where like I get to use my like bullshit detector and um, just really choose like the outstanding candidates that can fit in your teams the best. And I'll pass it on to Ben. Uh, hi everyone. Um, so I'm Ben Perez. I work at Pocket Network, um, which is a protocol for decentralized node infrastructure. Um, if you don't know what that is, you can come and talk to me and we can um, 
uh, talk about together. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to meeting lots of you. I'm an incredibly awkward person, so if I look to hug you and you put a hand out for a handshake, just warn you up front, that's who I am. Um, uh, and yeah, I think there's like lots of ways to think about Web3, but um, uh, one that I think about often is that it might be like the largest human re-education program since like the industrial revolution um i think the fact we're here today talking about different ways that we can develop people and upskill them is um it's a really important topic um the really important part i think um is to also not teach them all of the patriarchal power structures that um, are built into our existing educational systems. Um, so I'm really looking forward to talking about that a little bit. My station is about tactical development. Um, it's with a bunch of experts who are working on um, educational programs that you can potentially work with. So um, yeah, looking forward to chatting about that today. Okay, so um, we were gonna have you guys pepper out questions. I think we'll still do just like five minutes of that because we want y'all to have a good idea of what workstations um you should go into um and i might i might just uh make a little a little bit of distinction kind of between the workstations before i have you guys give questions so um as you know these three folks are are really focusing on peer review I think that one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, recruitment, you know, for like a life, uh, recruiting for a lifelong um, growth journey for any contributor. Um, and then the, the, the two that I wanna give you a little more distinction on is um, continuing education, which is me and Lenka, um, and tactical development, which is Ben. So at, at our station, we're gonna talk a little bit more about um, the learning environment in general. We're gonna talk about like brain plasticity and how to build like a culture of learning in your workplace. We'll talk a little bit more about like the philosophical education around crypto, um, the movement, what's important to know about that and how people can um, develop kind of as, you know, uh, thought leaders in Web3 as well as um, just doing a good job of being in these organizations and what it's like to develop those skills to exist in a DAO or wherever else um, versus Ben's station is more about the technical skills. Um, it's going to be about more tactical um, professional development stages. And like he said, he's got some visitors from various different developer education and other really tactical Web3 skill education cohorts. Um, so just so you know kind of the difference between those two um and before we go into breakouts um i'd love to just open up for a few questions these can be questions about like you know how do i um how do i execute um like a decentralized performance review or um how do i convince people in my org that this thing is important um just i just want to hear a few questions from you guys so so that we can see you melding into these breakouts better you can just raise your hand and i come with the microphone okay hey i'm alex a question from my side i come from web2 been in web3 for one year uh, i was fortunate to be in a web2 company that focused a lot on growth and hr and just helping us in in the company we were 200 people there coming in web3 i see it very focused on financial and technical part and missing that human side i try to bring that in the company it's not easy how to do that thanks that's a great question um and honestly i think it it steeped in the culture um, overall and kind of involves all of these aspects um, but I would say if I were you I would go to either like continuing education or to peer review um, I think those stations will have some some good answers for you yeah. okay do I see another hand okay there <laughs> sorry about that <laughs> thank you uh, really fascinating I have my question is how do you work during this bear market as a team and avoiding people burning out or not delivering or, or you know just a number of human issues during this bear market really you want to answer that i want to try 
Yeah, I think it's uh, very important to talk to your people and like actually hear out what's going on, why it's going on, and um, be it you know in one-on-one -on -one setting or through some sort of survey, um, anonymous or not, um, and just hear your people and like come up with things that you can do together um, to you know address some of the issues we're all facing burnout, wellness, you know, disconnecting from your laptop. That's a big one, I think, for everybody. Um, yeah. I'll add to that. So I like to call myself an emotional support human. Um, um, and I think, um, in, at least in at Giveth, um, what I do, if like someone's having a hard time, like I come in and like have a checkup call with them. I'm like, hey, what's going on? Like your productivity is down. Like you seem kind of sad on calls, like you're not showing up. And it's like a private neutral space. So we can just talk candidly about what's going on in their personal lives or if it's something internally going on. Um, and then we like don't, really dwell on the problem so much it's more like focused on solutions and like brainstorming how they can like communicate better or um how they can like um propose different ideas that they're kind of like struggling with so i i think it's it's especially in like this digital space it's really important to have like that human touch that we lose and when when we start losing that human touch is when people start feeling more isolated disconnected from teams so. I have one more answer to this question, <laughs> and then we'll pass it. Um, I I think that it's really advantageous to have like connection moments in your team and like uh, fun educational moments because sometimes when it's like not that fun to be at work, it's more fun to be at school and to remember that like even in the struggle of trying to have a successful business, that you're in a place where you're developing yourself so much and you're learning and that's thrilling and you are developing a sense of community um, and so that's like something that we're going to talk a lot about how to do at the continuing education station i really think you could take your pick from any station for this question um, but yeah just so you know okay <laughs> thank you okay go ahead Is it work? okay uh we are uh traditional organization and we, we have recently kick-started our progressive de decentralization process uh, and I can definitely see some resistance internally from some of the some of the colleagues uh, from the uh, perspective of being judged and seen by everybody else in the public basically uh, because I mean yeah when you're in a traditional organization everything is opaque uh, you are like you just work with your colleagues uh, like you have your manager uh, but when you're a contributor, when you're working in building in public, basically, uh, anybody can, can look at what you're doing, everybody can see your performance. So there's definitely uh, a mindset that some people do not have uh, coming from, I don't know, 10 years of experience in a traditional organization. How can we help them to, to kind of be, feel safe and, and uh, I don't know, feel uh, not judged, let's say, uh, yeah. Thank you for your question. Who wants to take this one? <laughs> I'll have a go. Um, the first thing I would try and say to those people is it's okay. <laughs> um, one of the things that I find um, about the experience of being in Web3 is that it does challenge you, but usually it challenges you by allowing you to see things that were sort of kept from you in the past. Um, and I think it's really important that people understand that maybe challenges around their development or their capability are okay, and that the conversations were happening before, often behind their back. Um, so I think it's like a really good healthy culture to have that transparency and it gives people the opportunity to lean into developing themselves and growing. I think the part that you're saying though, which is really tricky, is them feeling judged. And I think often that comes from the way that we communicate with each other. Um, so I think communication is a huge part of what we need to do to create safe environments. 
Um, and I think in this space, if anyone's ever heard of nonviolent communication by um, Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, Rosenthal, um, yeah, definitely great to pick up that book. It will not only change like your how you communicate and like your job and life, um, but I think when people feel judged, they tend to shut down, and uh, that's really easy to shut down when you're on a screen and like <laughs> you can literally just close and not engage with your team. So, did you have something? I I know we have another question coming too. I mean, I was definitely going to second that about clearly communicating. I think it's important to communicate some type of roadmap, maybe introduce like some phases into the transition. Um, and transparency is, of course, really important as well. So, yeah. Thank you. I'll be really quick. Um, it's mostly just a question that's clarifying, I hope. Um, ben, I think this is mostly directed to you. Um, I, I noted that Loie mentioned that this was kind of like the tactical and, or more technical skills. I, I'm curious if that's like really just geared to developers and like those hard skills in, in the space or if your workshop will also cover some of the um, kind of like frameworks that are necessary that may be for non-technical contributors. Yeah. Um, uh, so we will talk about one framework, just a way to think about your development and your capability. Um, our experts or our speakers are um, working on projects which are around technical skill development. Um, but they will talk about two things. They will talk about what their project is and does as something that you can think about the way people are addressing these challenges. And then they'll look to share their insights or expertise around what they've learnt from that experience, which would be generally applicable to any type of skill development. But um, yeah, they're a little bit more on the technical side, so I'm not, not sure how that answers your question. Yeah. OK. Right. Yeah. And so anyone who's like really feeling that the non-technical um, like skill journey, you could consider coming to continuing education, too. So, And I think that means it's really time for us to start these uh, these breakouts. Um, we have a lot more people in here than we were expecting. Uh, thank you all. You guys are great. <laughs> um, so we had originally made four different like groups of two tables. Um, I'm going to say you guys might need to pull more chairs around or, you know, if you even want to add a third table if the group is getting big. That's permissionless, in my opinion. Um, but let's just name these sections. So here we'll have peer review. So Saf, Melanie, and Anna will be at this huddle here. Um, in the back, we will have recruitment. So Heather is going to be there. Um, and then let's see. Up on this side, let's do continuing education. So that's me and Lenka. And then this group of two tables here will be tactical development. And Ben will be anchoring you guys over here. Um, so I'm just going to change these titles here. <laughs> Did you guys have fun in those breakout sessions? Yeah? OK, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Ooh. <laughs> um, so we'd love to hear uh, just some learnings from you. Before we go into that, I think we're going to just do the very last portion of continuing education all as one group together because um, it's about events. It's about the importance of being here at these conferences, at offsites, um, and Linka wanted to share a little bit about how being IRL at events really feeds into contributor education and development. And then after that, we'll, uh, we'll hear from you guys what you learned in your stations. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you guys. So uh, we also have a couple of uh, handouts. So if you didn't get the physical copy, you can just scan the QR and then you'll be able to get it. Uh, the one that is continuing education we've been doing, uh, this is the last bit of it. And it's basically talking about events because we are here at DEF CON. And we're also learning something new and sharing together. So um, it's 
quite interesting to actually consider like uh, in which ways do you think that having people as part of the events is helpful to your organization and then it's also interesting to think like not only one-sided that they're representing your organization but also at the same time that you help them to learn and grow so um, I have actually like three examples I would like to share with you uh, that might inspire you, but I would also like love to hear from you or maybe you can try to fill that uh, empty uh, box in the table yourself later on. So it kind of can inspire you, like how can you actually use events for continuing education to both uh, enable your contributors, but also like gain something uh, as a secondary um, uh, product of that as an organization. So, of course, uh, I have this marketing background, so this is very close to me. And the uh, first thing I would like to share out of the three takeaways is that I have been uh, hired to work for a distributed organization uh, to, to do community building for Europe. And that's quite a large area to co cover. I don't know where the noise comes from. <laughs> I think this one's better, thank you. So basically I was three months into my job and I went to my first in real life event. I have barely met anyone from my team or I barely have been to like a real crypto community event other than like what I knew in my area or something online. So. My first event was uh, ETH Berlin and I remember that I was in 18 and I just remember I was like really unsure like am I doing the job well, am I really building the community, am I really connecting to people and by actually being like at the first hackathon I actually understand what does it mean to be part of Ethereum community. I also understood you know like all these practice rounds you need to, to promote your project and like meet people who don't know about your project and you have to, as we talked about, like learning the basics, uh, teaching the basics to the people who never heard of your project, that's like quite a challenge and it's like exercise you need to do over and over. So after I came from ETH Berlin, I felt like, okay, I have met the people I actually work with, I understand the community better, I met other people in the same situation and I have the contacts I actually need to actually make some events and initiatives happen. And it's so much easier than trying to cold call or cold email someone because you met them at a party and you were sitting on a van together uh, at one of the closing events or something. So this is really good for roles that are outward facing, uh, community roles, BD roles, marketing roles anyone who really need to connect with the other people, other projects and the communities. It's really, really important. So make sure to include this as part of their onboarding or uh, personal growth, professional growth, because it really makes an impact. After, those, after that event, I felt like a lot of things have changed. Plus, I had a lot of uh, motivation and like the energy to keep going forward because like it really recharged me. So I think this works for many people as well. That's the first option. Second thing is I was also managing events. And you know, I really do not like if people go by title or CXO levels, etc. And everyone wanted room to speak, but I never wanted to do that. I was always looking for what is the opportunity and who would be the best person who could be the most knowledgeable on this. And you know, not always we had people who joined the org who are trained speakers, but I always try to like combine the two. And if they needed some support to be confident and comfortable on the stage, I wanted to provide them with. So it's a great way for people to like share their learning, share their experiences, like being with like-minded people and also like overcome this. And through this process of starting at a small event, coming to another one and another one, they can actually become like thought leaders. And many of the people, as we call them maker mafia, have been starting on that little stage with their nervousity, you know? So just support people, enable them to become speakers, give them the courage, give them the dress rehearsal, uh, help them with slides, help them with some practicalities and show them grow on the stage. It's really awesome. And uh, what was the third example? Sorry. Oh yeah, 
Um, so you probably love to talk about crypto and blockchain. So you imagine that many people are in this space. Then imagine they have like some super niche area they're nerding in and they're working with. Where can they talk to like-minded people at the events that focus on that specific topic at that specific level? So if you enable them to go to these events, they're not only are gonna like build a good network where they can spare with these people, but they also get to bounce ideas and maybe get inspired to like come with the next uh, best product. So I gave you like a three examples of how I think like events were really helpful personally for growth for different types of contributors and how you as a, as a person in your org who cares about building the talent inside could get inspired. Um, so hopefully this was helpful. And uh, it's very, very good to consider events being a uh, part of your uh, budget or plan, how you actually uh, manage your team or how you grow your team. Of course, there always has to be a good connection. Why are you sending this person? And is this person going to appreciate and be happy for it? But it's a really good thing to consider if you want to have a strong team that really enjoys the work that they're doing and is grateful to be in the org that they are in. So it was a quite a long uh, example <laughs> of why events are important, but we're all here at DevCon, we're learning together, we're sharing together. So I just thought to share this with you. Uh, please don't be shy to ask your team lead or whoever it is, whether you can go to the event, and represent the org. I think most of the time you meet with very positive response. And you can and always support. call back on Lenka's examples, right? <laughs> we have lots of examples of why this is yeah, important. I can vouch for you. <laughs> that's, that's part of what we want to do in this workshop is give you guys ways to argue for these elements, ways to argue for professional development, ways to argue for an events budget, ways to argue for time spent connecting um, and educating, right? Because sometimes it can be hard to prioritize that to budget in but there is absolutely a business case for it um, and y'all whether you are org leaders being convinced yourselves or you have a leader you can go convince now you have some um, some tools and some some facts to, to share there um, and just so you know uh, that like last prompt that Lenka responded to this is kind of a homework item that we left for you guys it's on the continuing education worksheet um, and the prompts are like in what ways have you benefited from going to events and like what roles do you think benefit the most from that um, so great reflections to have especially continuing education folks love for you to reflect on that and any of you um, can scan the QR codes that we've provided. It'll take you to the, the Notion site for the People Ops Guild, um, and you can see all of the all of the worksheets that we have there. Um, so with that, I'd love to just hear from you guys like a little bit of what you learned. Um, what were your takeaways uh, from these workstations you were at? And I can I can go around and pass Mike. So which is the first workstation? <laughs> um, we were the continuing education workstream, and I guess one of the main takeaways, um, or one of the things that's going to stick with me is the idea of incorporating some sort of 80-20 rule into how we ask contributors to invest their time to allow them at least 20% of their time to go out and actually learn um, and contribute to other orgs and bring and actually and bring that learning back also just for their personal growth and development Anything else to add? Oh, I, I also just want to say continuing education station if any of you guys want to share what game you came up with <laughs> you're welcome to uh, I passed by a couple of stations but my first and main one was the recruitment one it was amazing, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so I learned how to like search for people with a spark of interest to like start a community from scratch because we can't do this alone. We need to build builders. <laughs> uh, and we learned how to search for these people, how to retain them, uh, how to keep them engaged and inspire them to uh, teach more people later. Which was, which is like the seed that you plan to like grow everything after. Yeah, 
That was amazing. Thank you. Well done, Heather. Um, thank you so much for the continuing education workshop. I was there to contribute, but I think I, I actually gained so much that I w was not expecting. Really, I was just like, oh, just tune into this. But I've been doing this for a couple of years, mostly on my own. Um, but I somehow have managed to gather contributors, volunteers for now around me that are supporting me. And I'm a bit emotional just thinking that I would have wished them to be here um, with me at DEF CON because they've done so much to support me. And I just wish that I can get to that point where I would bring them on and I want to include events for them. I'm already like thinking where they should all go and grow in their own respective um, areas of interest because apparently they like to be around me <laughs> already without me paying them. But I think just, you know, I'm thinking like bring merch back for them and stickers, just something like just little snippets. But next time I want them at DEF CON um, with me. And the second thing is the social gathering hour. I think that's such a brilliant idea. Um, I think I was doing it sort of in a very loose, casual way, but to actually make time, spend an hour to just connect, share books, share the latest crypto news together and just have that moment and to make time for that um, is what I'm going to be implementing moving forward. So thank you so much. And I might hire you for the social gathering just to, to launch it and do games together. Well, thank this is so why much. we need to pay educators like you, right? And we need to put education budgets into our team so that like your project and the contributors who volunteer for you can come to these places and keep doing more of what they're doing um, and be funded to do that. Crypto Canal, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. Who is? Are you? There you go. So, we came up with a fun game for uh, engaging with people, uh, and that would be to have their coworkers describe them as a cryptocurrency. Ooh. <laughs> Might be a little shady, but uh, all in good fun, we promise. And yeah, just so thank you for the space. Thanks, Peyton. Hi, everyone. I really want to say thank you to the peer review team. It was a lot of interesting insights and a lot of interesting discussions. The takeaway that I'm going away with is creating that safe space for people, that people need to have a safe space. Just because we're in the Web3 world doesn't mean we're different and from IRL. So creating that safe space, that one-on-one -on -one conversation, and building that human connection, because that's what's most, most fragile. And yeah, I thank you. Thank you. In the peer review workshop, we introduced a few frameworks for the participants to use while giving feedback. Um, that's one thing that's really difficult to do. It's easy to give positive feedback. It's definitely difficult to give corrective feedback. So we you know, provided some frameworks for them to use. And um, I think it seemed really helpful. Unfortunately, not everybody's here from our workshop still, but um, that's just a little bit about what we did there. OK, one more game that I wanted to suggest is only to have fun. It's a usual game, but uh, in our space, like, what did you do at DEF CON? And pe people who play the game, like, raising their hands if, uh, if they did the same. And win who have less people who did the same. That's a cool one. Thank you. Um, which station did we not hear from, or is there anyone else? Oh yeah, Ben. Oh, there you hear. Yeah. I have glasses. Um, uh, so I haven't sort of uh, synthesized all of the answers, um, partly because um, I know being in um, my session that I had massive FOMO that I wasn't in the other sessions. Um, uh, so actually on our board, we've got um, the websites for the people who presented. Um, I thought they were all fantastic, lots of, uh, lots of great insights there. So um, we just encourage you on the way out to maybe uh, take a screenshot of, um, of those websites that are, uh, that are up on the board. Um, they're doing really cool things. And if you're looking to develop people or collaborate with uh, experts in the space, um, yeah, I think that's really great. Do, do we still have any of the educators here? For, oh, okay. Yeah. I know you guys finished early. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
If there's not more takeaways, I also have another question for you guys, but I'm just going to scan if anyone else wants to share another takeaway. Okay. So I have a question for you guys. Um, we would love to know, uh, for us as a guild, what else would you guys want from the People Operations Guild? We've already put out some stuff on on uh, on education and development here, um, and uh, we've put out like a couple of resources online. But we'd love to hear from y'all what's needed from a guild of, you know, decentralized HR folk. <laughs> this will totally not come as a surprise that I I bring this up. Um, in the sense that you're specialized in it, Louis, uh, and it hadn't, hasn't really come up, I think, yet. But um, so we all work in remote organizations, which um, means that you cannot just go to up to like a person's desk for like two minutes and be like, hey, that thing in that meeting, there was like this small disagreement or that misunderstanding. I wanted to explain what that was. So what happens is that tensions build up. And so I think um, having um, all various forms of, of um, conflict resolution and remediation in DAOs is massively important. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. So I definitely can. I'm very passionate about decentralized conflict resolution. Um, I would love to call out that there is a group dedicated to this, Gravity DAO. They uh, run a cohort of conflict resolution education called the Graviton Training. I think there's been two or three so far to date. Um, and it's a great like discussion group on, on topics of conflict resolution. But I also really recommend um, just being aware of trained facilitators. They exist in the space. Um, I've collected a roster of like 10 of them that are ready to provide this service to various crypto orgs. So you can always reach out to me. Um, to get in contact with those people. Um, and in general, it's worth it to provide some training on um, you know, reflective listening um, and safe communication and conflict resolution to your teammates. You know, if you're going to have this time for team training or for connection hour, you could consider um, having a nonviolent communication specialist come in. Uh, you could consider watching some videos on restorative justice together um, or bringing in a pr practitioner to talk about this um, and, and guide people through some exercises because the whole point of conflict resolution in a decentralized sense is that it belongs to us. It belongs to the people who are in conflict. It's not about some external judge or jury. Um, it's about um, the people who are closest to an issue having um, the most agency in how to solve it. And I know that that will stick well with your teams because most people who work in this space really value that, um, that self-agency and decentralization. I think that's a great point to make, um, to bring in some type of external facilitation. Um, in our peer review workshop, you know, we introduced these frameworks of how to give feedback, um, but some people are asking, what about if the person isn't receptive? What if I'm talking to my founder and, you know, I'm nervous and I don't know how I can give him this feedback, but he really needs to know. Um, and that's what we suggested, bringing in some type of facilitation, some type of mediation to help support you through those difficult conversations. Because like I said, giving any type of corrective feedback is not easy. Um, you may also not be fully equipped or have the skill set to do that. Um, so leaning on someone else, I think, is also really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, so we have people all across Europe at the moment, um, and I would say in terms of diversity, we're doing okay. There's still some more work to do. I don't feel like it's a focus in my organization at the moment, um, and I don't really know how to bring it up in terms of like intercultural communication, to have it like in a sensitive manner, but also just like providing a place to work from people from all types of background. Um, so I'm wondering, like, do you have any like type of information about that topic? 
We have people among us in the guild who work in DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I would definitely defer to them um, as far as providing resources on that. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of times it's about like just advocating to the decision makers that this is important and worthwhile. And if you can at least get them to say yes to a consultant, um, then those consultants are the are the best folks to put it in the right lingo. You know, they can they can speak to your um, to your founders on like the real business cases of having an inclusive environment. They also can speak really sensitively to people that are just experiencing a hard time in the work environment. Um, so like I'm not um, a specialist in that myself, but uh, one of our guild members, Sandy, um, has a background in DEI, um, also a personal friend and co uh, colleague from Gitcoin, Gloria Kimbuala, um has done a lot of DEI work, so I certainly would just like recommend those people. And if you want to get in touch, uh, feel free to go through me if you need to. Thank you. Okay, that's that. <laughs>